So good afternoon and welcome everybody to the Art at Work workshop today. My name is Kathy Tykolis. I'm the Richmond Art Gallery's Education and Public Programs Coordinator and I will be hosting today along with our two presenters, Annie Verard and April Britsky. Um, so I want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, and for those of you who might be new to the program, it is a monthly series that the City of Richmond's Art Services runs generally from January to June. So for today's presenters are both um, artists with a background working with many galleries, organizations, and in particular with CARFAC. Um, if you are new to CARFAC, it stands for Canadian Artist Representation, the Front Artiste Canadienne, and they are the national voice for visual artists in Canada. They actively engage in advocacy, lobbying, research, and public education on behalf of artists in Canada. Uh, they are the ones who advocate for artist fees and fair payment for artists, um, as well as they provide a ton of resources for artists. So I highly recommend checking out their website, both the Carfac BC and Carfac National. So my guests today are Annie Burrard, who's a Vancouver-based artist. Uh, we have posted her bio in the chat. Uh, she has been very active with Carfac BC in the past. And we have April Britsky, who is the current executive director of Carfac National. So I just want to welcome both Annie and April. I will fade into the background and monitor the questions and come back whenever we have questions popping up throughout today. So again, please uh, use the Q&A option and send us in your questions throughout the session. But you can take it away, April and Annie. Thanks, Kathy. I think yeah. April was was going to get us started, so I may I may sit back, yeah. but um, you can you can ping me or wave at me if you want me to jump in. Sure. Um, hi everybody. So I'm April Britsky, and I'm the executive director of Carfac, which is an artist-run organization that advocates for artists' economic and legal rights. And I'm gonna maybe share the screen. Our work takes place from coast to coast to coast, and I am joining you today from the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Kwikwetlem nations. And I'm going to give a, a, an introduction on what artist fees are, because I'm not sure what everyone's familiarity is like. Um, uh, in, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of the new guidelines that Carfac developed last year. Uh, with a couple of examples, and then Annie and I will sort of have a, a talk about um, some of the things to consider um, when it comes to online presentations. So uh, Perfect provides tools to help artists negotiate better working conditions based on the standards such as like our fee schedule, which has been developed by and for artists. And in the fee schedule, we make recommendations on what artists should be paid for copyright uses and other services. And you can find it online in French and English. The website um, is available there. Um, so the fee schedule um, ha was Carfax first project, basically. We, it, we were created in 1968 over the principle of fair payment for artists. And so before this, nobody was getting paid um, for exhibitions or the reproduction of their work. Um, it was argued that uh, if you show your work for free, it gives you good exposure. But as we all know, um, you can't pay your bills with exposure. So um, artists really put pressure on galleries. And then the Canada Council for the Arts made it a requirement that museums who receive uh, grants uh, from them have to pay artist fees and others followed. And so over time, most public galleries started to use our guidelines as the industry standard, which continues today. So our rates are um, recommended as a minimum payment as we maintain that artists should uh, have the right to negotiate more. And our guidelines are only for an artist's copyright or their time and labor. It shouldn't be used to offset other related expenses like travel or insurance or equipment rentals that a gallery may have when they're showing an exhibition. So what do we mean by artist fees? Well, there's a few different things. Um, so an exhibition royalty, often known as a, an artist fee or a Carfac fee, is a copyright royalty that an artist receives when your work is exhibited. And the Copyright Act includes an exhibition right, uh, which applies to exhibitions of art made after 1988. And if you have an exhibition where the work is not available for sale, you should be paid a royalty, which is determined by the length and scope of the exhibition and the operating budget of the presenter. 
reproduction right is also in the Copyright Act, and those royalties apply when your work is reproduced in several different ways. Um, everything from film trailers and web and social media posts to uh, print and online publications, uh, postcards, calendars, and much, much more. So we have different rates for commercial and non-commercial uses, which are found in the fee schedule. And then professional services fees are not copyright royalties. They're payments for giving a presentation or a workshop, uh, providing advice or consultation, writing about your art, participating on a jury, um, installing or your work or preparing for an exhibition. And this is for work carried out by an artist as an artist. It doesn't include work that artists may do in other roles, like as a curator, we don't determine what other cultural workers get paid, even if, if you are an artist as well. So just to give you kind of a quick snapshot of what um, some of our fees look like, um, our, here are our current rates for a solo exhibition, which increase every year, currently by 2%. The basis of our fee schedule is the solo exhibition royalty, and the rates vary according to the institution's budget and some other considerations. And all exhibition or all other exhibition and reproduction royalties are available online. It is worth noting that we also have a collective agreement with the National Gallery and the rates that we negotiate with them are typically higher, in some cases much higher. So a solo show with them is currently 9,500. Um, and then we negotiated various other um, rates with them. And our agreement with, with them is on Carfax National web, uh, National's website, so carfax.ca. If you're a member of a copyright collective, like Copyright Visual Arts, they negotiate higher rates on your behalf and they charge an admin fee to the presenter. Um, so I can tell you more about their services if you're interested. In terms of professional services fees, this is sort of what they look like. Um, our, our, uh, our professional services rates are um, based on full day or half day flat rates. And the ones that are most commonly paid are probably the presentation fees. Um, so if you give an artist talk, uh, we don't recommend hourly or prorated payments because a lot of work goes into preparing um, for a presentation. So you might be only speaking for 15 minutes on a panel, but you usually have to participate in that discussion for an hour or two answering questions. And it can take hours or even days to, to prepare that talk. So we, we do recommend more of a flat rate and the half day rate is really just the minimum. But it is what most people get. So that's what payments looked like before 2020. <laughs> and then everything changed really fast. So um, last April, we released some new guidelines for paying artists during the pandemic without really knowing how long things may carry on for. And of course, we still don't really know. Um, venues may be forced to close or reopen for some time. And we want to be sure that there are some guidelines in place. Um, and we do review them so that they um, continue to accurately reflect what's happening, but that is hard to do. The situation is so different across the country. Um, people have so many different types of projects. It's hard to capture everything. So it isn't perfect and it needs to be flexible. The new guidelines provide advice and recommend recommended payments for, for various uses. Um, and we, can we encourage presenters to really support artists to the best of their abilities to consider the financial pressures that many artists may be currently facing and to compensate them for additional labor that may be involved um, if they're asked to change, say, the format of an exhibition or a screening or a presentation. Um, we hope organizations pay as quickly as they can because it could be a lifeline. Not everybody is eligible for CERB. Um, I guess I do wanna say we're very lucky that the government introduced CERB and, gov and emergency funding for artists and organizations. Um, we're also probably in a somewhat better position in the visual arts than our performing arts colleagues. You know, going to a gallery isn't really all that different than going to the grocery store. You can keep your distance, whereas going to a, a symphony where there's loads of wind instruments, like that's that's not going to be an easy thing to do for for um, our colleagues in other disciplines for some time. So, so we are lucky in that way. But you know, I also know it's been hard really hard um, on artists um, that had exhibitions planned that were suddenly canceled. Um, many people depended on the fees, but also they were just really looking forward to the recognition that comes with a show. So dealing with that loss at the same time as a public health crisis is, is difficult. So if that's you, I'm very sorry. 
and I really hope that things improve soon. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're if you're an artist, um, I would recommend definitely asking about payment uh, for whatever people are asking you to do right now as early as possible so that you know what the terms and conditions are and send an invoice with details on how to pay you because organizations can rarely pay you without an invoice. So make it as easy as possible to pay you. We also know that presenters are facing new pressures. There's a real scramble to put everything online and to prepare programming with plan B to plan Z um, in place. So um, just to give you some perspective, when, when we put some new guidelines out there, like the city of Vancouver and major institutions like the Science Center were facing possible bankruptcy. So it's quite hard to figure out how to like to recommend new guidelines under these kinds of circumstances. So, and even now no one is operating under normal circumstances. And so we didn't really know how things might change. Um, so we tried to be as balanced um, as possible. And one of the first recommendations, for example, that we made was that if a show opened and suddenly had to close and that artists, um, that they should get their, their royalty right away and all parties should be as flexible um, about extending shows potentially after the gallery reopens as possible. Payment terms around that are negotiable, but artists should really be paid more if they're asked to put in extra labor to help with un unexpected programming plans. Um, so here's uh, one example of, uh, of a new recommendation that we um, had made. So if a show is planned but didn't open, and a museum decides to do a virtual exhibition instead, um, we felt that the artist should be paid the usual exhibition royalty. An online exhibition is a difficult thing to define potentially. Use your judgment. Is this replacing an, uh, an in-person exhibition? Does it require a team of staff to put together? Is there a catalog? There's a lot of different factors to consider and they don't all have to be included to be considered a, an online exhibition, but, um, but I guess just thinking about what else might make it look and feel like an alternative to a normal exhibition. Um, there's a difference between an online exhibition and posting one image of an artwork on a website without any context, for example, um, uh, which still does include a fee, but a different kind. So um, there are hundreds of presenters in Canada and they're all doing different things. So if there's any doubt about what's a fair payment, like ask the artist and we recommend that um, institutions contact us for advice. So another example uh, where, where an institution did contact us and then we ended up using them as an example in the new guidelines is um, this one here. So um, a, a university art gallery um, was planning on developing an online geomapping project that related works um, to their permit, to, sorry, related to works in their permanent collection. So the collection includes works by artists that have um, responded to the surrounding city or the landscape where the gallery is located. And they were gonna put these 20 pieces from their collection as points of interest on an interactive map. So users would click on a point to see the work that's associated with that location. And images of the artworks um, are embedded within the map platform um, and then they would appear with um, different of like label information about the artwork and then some text just like giving it some context. So in this example we were really wondering okay is this an exhibition? Is it a virtual tour? Is it like permanently installing works from the collection in the museum? Is it actually kind of all three? <laughs> um, are, are the works mostly made by living artists or are they managed by estates? What's the gallery likely to afford now, but also in the long run? So we decided um, together that the, the digital map really does function like a virtual walkthrough of the town, but it is most similar to an exhibition of selected works from the permanent collection. Um, so we recommended that the minimum payment be um, the permanent collection rate, which at that at this point at this this year would be two hundred and eighty one dollars per work um, involved in the map. So the project may exist for years, and new new works may be added, which increases the fees paid to artists over time. So I mean, this is a big project with long term use. Is two hundred and eighty one dollars fair? 
it's hard to say. Um, you know, there's 20 works, so that ups, adds up to about $5,600 for the whole, um, like fees for the whole project. Um, if it was a temporary show, the fees would probably be about double for a group show. Um, but, you know, this is a nice way to share the collection, uh, potentially with a wider audience. It's a lot better than building an image database on the museum's website, which would be a significantly lower royalty. So it did seem um, reasonable to us as a minimum guide. Um, and so I think there's a question. Should I take it? Um, Wondering if we're covering musicians, performers, entertainers, and our artists uh, workshop today. Um, well, no, we're an association for professional visual artists. Um, I don't know whether uh, like the Canadian, uh, Canadian Federation of Musicians or Canadian Actors Equity or ACTRA have similar guidelines. I assume they, they do. I mean, the way that they work is quite different. So um, they, they negotiate union rates and it would depend on whether or not the uh, um, the engagement is moving forward, which right now is um, probably, like probably unlikely for in in most cases. So um, I would I would I would recommend contacting um, the uh, the unions that represent artists in those those disciplines. But having said that, like our fee schedule does include performance art rates, and it does also include fees and royalties for media artists, so film film and video. Yeah. But thank you for that question, it's given. Um, we'll give a couple more examples. And so a lot of things have changed since, since we started developing these rates a year ago, obviously. Now some museums may be open. They may also want to create a virtual exhibition. A gallery asked us recently, they said that um, they have a sh they're they're open, but they also want to create a virtual show. We technically don't really have guidelines for that um, specifically because what we came up with for the virtual shows was like when virtual shows were the only thing in town happening. So um, we sort of helped guide them through figuring out what might be fair, and it, and it will potentially become a recommendation in our our, in our guidelines. It isn't currently, but we we after you know talking. To, the project through finding out more details about it we decided that you know they would pay the regular rate for the in-person show and then they would use the um, project rate for the added component of, uh, of a digital show so that's like the solo rate minus 15 percent every gallery situation and budget really needs to be considered as well as the needs of an artist so yeah there's a lot of things to consider it kind of feels like those choose your own adventure books that kids liked in the 80s and 90s i don't know if you're familiar with those where like the story is told through a labyrinth of different choices that the reader makes to determine the outcome of the story and the fee schedule is a bit like that except i don't have a magic book with the answers but you know we use the current guidelines and common sense to sort of help people through so i'm going to talk about one more um example oh i seem to be frozen or at least my slide does there we go is that it yeah okay so what if an artist is asked to give a virtual talk or workshop or studio tour or lead a guided tour of an exhibition so a presentation might be related to an exhibition but it may not be um it may be presented as a live webinar like this with or without an interactive audience it could be a pre-recorded video or a podcast that's shared either for free to everyone or to paid subscribers. Um, so there's a lot of different variables to consider, um, but in any case, the artist should be paid a professional fee. We still recommend the ones that we list in section four of our fee schedule for that. Um, but the kinds of things that you might want to consider either as an artist or as a presenter might include um, you know, the artist should be always be asked if they're okay with recording it. And um, if you give permission to share that recording, uh, when we do webinars, you know, if we're recording, we tell registered participants at the start that we're recording and we tell them like, if you don't want to be seen, turn off your camera um, kind of a thing. Um, so far, all of our webinars have been posted on a password protected section of our webpage. So they're not as widely available and they probably won't be up permanently but they they probably will be up for a while um for the people who registered for it uh, some presenters may not want to be recorded especially if it's a workshop like if you're giving a skills 
uh, like you're teaching a painting workshop or you know if you're offering a workshop on how to apply for grants or artist residencies um, in that kind of scenario especially I think it probably shouldn't be recorded or if it is um, it should really be only available for a limited time and ideally sort of protected or behind a paywall or with geo-blocking or some combination of those things and the reasoning that that is different than you know just giving a talk is you know artists often give these kinds of presentations regularly and they may charge for that. So it's how you learn, earn a living. And if it's available to everyone, they may not be hired to deliver it as often anymore or people may no longer sign up. So for that reason, they may not wanna share their slides or their handouts either. Um, or if they do, they may have certain controls like only registered participants can have access. Um, I took some online classes last year and I had some really basic handouts that I made my own notes on, but I couldn't access the slides after a month and it wasn't recorded. So every situation, depending on what you're doing, is going to be a little bit different. If an organization wants to record a different kind of presentation, like an interview or a studio visit and make it available for a longer period, depending on the nature of the presentation, you could potentially increase the fee, depends on how the artist feels about making it available, um, if it's available forever, for example. So if you're talking about their work, they may wanna have it accessible for as long as possible, depends on, how, on, depending on the conversation and how it's being promoted, a higher fee may potentially be appropriate. Um, if an artist has added costs to shift things online, we recommend that the host cover those costs or technical support within reason, like most people can get a free Zoom account um, and that may be all you need. But you know, man, many of us are also working from home and that comes with added challenges like noise disruption from other people. So some speakers, for example, might need some child hair, care um, costs covered. I planned this during my son's nap and so far it seems like he's asleep. <laughs> Um, if not, my, my husband's going to take over, but, you know, not everybody has that support. And my child is cute, but very distracting in Zoom meetings, let me tell you. So, um, yeah, it, I, I would recommend, you know, checking with people if that's the kind of thing that they need. Um, and then I guess finally, whatever your arrangement, I always recommend having a contract. Um, use something as specific to your situation as possible. Carfac has some sample contracts for various things, and they come with explanations about what the terms mean and what to watch out for. Now we're working on templates um, for online presentations and speaking engagements. But, you know, like boilerplate contracts can be helpful, um, but they, all, they always need revision. Um, uh, for your specific use. So, and everybody should read it to make sure that it actually makes sense for what you're doing. I recently gave a, a workshop on uh, copyright and, uh, and in that presentation, I spent some time explaining the difference between a license and an assignment of rights. And I'm not gonna get into it, but like basically, we generally recommend that artists license the use of their work rather than giving away their rights to it. And the day after the workshop, the organizer sent, sent me the contract, which is also not a good idea, like send it ahead of time because um, it protects both sides uh, for sure. But um, the contract actually asked me for an assignment of rights, which I was like, did you even listen to what I had to say? <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, I like even if I wanted to, I included images of other artists' work in my presentation, which I did license. And so I don't have the ability to sign rights, even if I wanted to. So um, I read it over and told them, like, these are the things I can't agree to. And um, and they changed it. And hopefully they'll probably be using it with other people and, you know, learn from that as well. But um, yeah, I don't know. These are just some of the things, like I said, it's a huge choose your own adventure. So yeah. Um, it looks like there might be questions. Um, as you asked, somebody did put on a contract workshop months ago for the new swap from live performances to live streaming. Contracts for performers. And you're hoping this workshop will cover that too. Um, well, like I said, I mean, if it's for performers that are not performance artists, I would recommend contacting, um, I don't know who Camyar is, so I don't, um, whether it's a uh, musician's union or, or actor. Um, um, April, if I can just 
that in. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think too that connects that, that question about uh, moving online. I do think that connects because um, Camier actually works here in the Art Center, um, and they've we've moved as most of us have. We've moved everything online, you know, workshops, um, right. performances, uh, but things like this, which would normally be a talk in person. Um, are there any guidelines? I mean, I know we don't do you, you're not dealing with performers, but for art visual artists who have moved, whether it's a class. Mm -hmm. a workshop, artist talk, um, moving it online, are there certain fees for that? Like, would it just be the same as what a normal artist fee would be? But then I know the other big question that we all have is how long does it get to live online? And do we need to pay additional fees for that extended time? Because normally when you go to a live talk, that's it, it's one and done. Um, mm -hmm. But now things are living online. So are there any, and again, I know this is all new, so it might not yeah. have firm fees yet, but is there um, sort of any guidelines for organizations, but as well for the artists and how much they should charge? Like I said, it's a choose your own adventure. So I, I don't know. I mean, we recommend as a minimum our half day rate um, if you're giving a talk or doing a workshop or something, but if it's and, and definitely if it's the kind, like for this, you know, this is the kind of thing that I don't think necessarily you, you would have a, an added fee if you make it available longer. But like if I, if I was doing a workshop on copyright um, with, or if, you know, an artist was giving one and that's something they regularly do and, and get paid for, then I definitely wouldn't recommend posting it online. Um, you may make it available like in a private view for a shorter period of time for people who registered or whatever, but like as a long-term thing, not so much. In terms of like, you know, I've watched a few different interviews with artists uh, where they're talking about their work um, and it may get posted on like a long-term on a website. Uh, I don't know whether people were paid extra for it to be up longer. I, I would say something like that. It's not as critical because you're probably not going to lose out on other money over it. And maybe maybe you'd want to have it up longer. I would ask each person how they feel about it though. But yeah, it makes it harder to, plan. I don't know, maybe Annie has, like you've probably been asked to do these those kind of talks more than I have, so. Sorry, I was just uh, trying to answer another question in the in the Q and A. Um, can you can you repeat, April, what you were what you were asking me about? Well, like if if somebody was to ask you to talk, like do a presentation about your work, um, and they want to keep it up uh, long term right. without any any kind of controls whatsoever, like. Uh, how do you feel about those kinds of questions? Like, do you, are you okay with having it live forever online? Or you, do you think that's the kind of thing that should have a higher fee or not associated with it? Yeah, I think it really depends on, um, the, there are a number of factors that, that I think uh, we, we need to be considering when doing any kind of uh, work online and when doing all of the, what, what I would call sort of um, expanded work that we're being asked for as artists right now during the pandemic. It's not enough to just show, we need to have the promo, the interview video, the studio walkthrough, the blah, blah, blah. And so anyway, I'll give some examples about that. Um, but what, what I would really recommend is um, creating a couple of uh, boundaries. So any contract, right, is not a viable legal contract unless it has uh, very specific terms set. And so that would include an end date, usually, um, and a certain mm -hmm. use, uh, so, so a licensing um, uh, kind of standard for that, that particular work, right? So on the website from this date to this date, or mm -hmm. on the website and on social media, or and on website, social media, and in, in you know, uh, press uh, communique. Uh, so that would be one thing. But then the other thing that I would really suggest uh, or, or that I've been even for, for my own practice really thinking about is like, what's the reputability of the, the venues and the people that you're working with, mm -hmm. right? Because some of them really do have um, the, the, some good mutual benefit there for, for the artists and their audience and their, their own organization. Um, and in some cases, it's it's maybe a little bit more, um, a little bit less less clear. 
right? So that would be part of it as well. Like what, what are their goals uh, for that content? And can you, can you sort of trust uh, just from their, their track record and their reputation, uh, how, how that will be used? And if, if there's any kind of sense of, of wavering on that front, then yeah, having it really well laid out in a contract, I think is really important. Um, we have two questions that I think we can kind of wrap into one, um, getting back to who gives fees. Um, there's a question about what types of organization can you request fees from, um, or just how do you know whether a gallery should be paying you a fee or not? I mean, I know you have a bit of a listing, but if you may want to give a little bit more info on that. Yeah, so, I mean, public, um, oof. well, it depends. Like, if you're talking about an exhibition, it's usually a public gallery that or a museum um, that is not actively selling your work. Um, I know that a lot of arts councils in particular in this province don't pay. Um, and that's something that we, we have so much to do in terms of advocacy on. But typically, like if, if a gallery or museum um, is showing your work, and especially if they're getting public funding, they they should be in some cases are required to pay those kind of fees. In terms of presentations, um, I mean, really anybody who asks you should should probably be. I mean, I know it might be different if it's um, well, I don't know. Uh, like if an individual asks you and wants to record an interview, I don't know. I don't. I don't know how they how and where they would share something like that. Maybe that might not make sense. Uh, but you know. Um, an organization or a presenter or a university or uh, any anything like that i would say typically like any any organization or institution or venue that's receiving some kind of public funding uh, would be mm -hmm. required uh, by those funders to be paying uh, artist fees right and so the only situations where that wouldn't apply is if that venue or organization or presenter is able to um, kind of justifiably show that they are compensating the artist in an alternative way, uh, which would usually mean through sales or, or something of that nature. Uh, of course, we know that there are many venues that don't pay artist fees, um, and those tend to be, uh, yeah, like for, for profit enterprises or organizations that are not yet uh, recognized as having not-for-profit or, or charitable, charitable um, uh, kind of society, uh, um, yeah, registrations. Um, another question connected to that is just, and there is a fee structure for galleries to pay, but is there a fee structure for things like workshops? I guess, would that just be the professional fees that you include the up to four hours? So that would be mm -hmm. what that is. Okay, another yeah. qu question. Um, I'll just read it because, yeah, author, illustrator of a children's ebook are offered to talk on promotional and hobby websites, social media, schools. Do these types of fees stand for those instances as well? I guess that would be a speaking fee on social I would media. think so, but I don't know. I mean, it's a slightly different industry. I, I would imagine most authors get paid when they do a book tour. So I would think it would be similar, but I really couldn't say. I should say one thing that's a bit of a gray area is like, in like mm, publishers or like news reporting, like the CBC doesn't pay every single person that they interview. They do usually pay if they're going to reproduce your work, though. So um, if it's for news reporting, it's pretty unlikely that they will. But I know a lot of art journals right now are thinking about how and when they should pay um, for different kinds of things like podcasts or articles and stuff like that. Yeah, we're kind of in a little bit of so so sort of pre pandemic it was fairly clear that, again, it was sort of a matter of um, is, are, are you being asked to do this as part of like, uh, you know, a non a nonprofit uh, society or somebody serving that kind of audience, or is it a for profit kind of venture? And then you would typically sort of determine if, if it was a for profit venture, um, are you profiting from it? Like if I'm doing something, um, 
right now so many artists are being asked for expanded uh, content. If I'm being asked that by my gallerist, uh, she's not paying me, but we're business partners and she's selling and representing my work, right? And so it makes sense mm -hmm. as, a, as a partnership that we're doing this. Uh, but if a, if a gallery or magazine or art fair uh, that's not representing uh, your work, right, asks you for this kind of content, mm -hmm. then it's up to you to say, well, you know, I mean, why, why am I doing this for free? There are certain fees yeah. that, uh, that Carfac has established. So using those presentation fees as a guideline is, is really the way to go. But then also determining like, what are, what are the cost benefits uh, that, that would be coming out of that, right? Are you likely to greatly expand your audience? or are you not? Is it something that's going to cost you a lot of time and money, um, you know, or not? And I know when the, when the pandemic first hit, within the first three weeks, I was asked by about six different, uh, like two galleries, a curatorial collective, a magazine, a festival and a fair to produce all this expanded content for them, right? For their social media. I wasn't paid for any of it. Um, and, myself as a media artist, it was like, well, I'm going to kind of script this. I'm going to try and do semi-decent lighting, you know, I'm going to edit it. There's, there's all of these kinds of things involved. And so then you have to ask yourself, is your audience likely to expand from it? Is it a reputable enough venue or organization that it's going to sort of add something to your practice or to the, the recognition that you're getting to your practice? Is it something that you can do really quickly on the fly with your phone or your computer and just film it and upload it or is it something that requires scripting and costume change and you know editing um so these are these are all things i think that that we need to keep in mind and and as artists that we need to be uh, i know there's folks from kind of both sides uh, that are joining us today some organizations and some some artists but is really to think of what's yeah what's the mutual benefit there and for artists to feel free to push back because I feel like, I don't know, like the, I, I don't know that I've ever been as overworked as this year. And I'm looking at a lot of artists out there where it's, um, you know, even beyond exhibitions and, and the regular thing, just being asked to produce so much content for the press, for social media, um, gallery shows that are now also online, right? And so it's really having to push back on that and, um, and using, I think, the Carfax fee schedule as a, as a guideline. Are most people offering you payment or, and has the tendency changed since a year ago to now? Yeah, I think so at the very beginning, I think that we were all just flying blindly. And I think that there was the recognition from from many uh, galleries and cultural producers that uh, it's sort of the the law of the the first adherence, right? Similarly to uh, I don't know sites like Etsy or Instagram, it's like if you get on it right away, then you have the chance to really get some visibility and get that audience going. So I think that people weren't even stopping to think so much about wait, should we be paying for this? Should we be charging for this? It was kind of just a mad dash to um, to just jump in and and get things done uh, so that you know you could you could provide a, a sense of um, maybe security and hope uh, to, to the community and, and certainly some, some visibility as well. For my part, I now refuse a lot of that uh, extra stuff unless, like I say, it's within you know, a, a certain business partnership that I have where I'm sort of equally benefiting from it or um, making sure that there are some fees that are, that are being covered. So if, if, if we look at, there are a number of arts organizations in Canada, which I think we can look to that already have kind of paved the, the path for that type of thing. And mostly I would say those tend to be organizations that already had been dealing within uh, media arts, right? Because they were used to already uh, realizing that, okay, well, the, the production of a video or whatever has um, a, a significant uh, inherent value and a, a significant cost to it. So some, some examples, uh, I, I thought maybe we could talk about residencies, but maybe I won't jump into that just yet. But there are some, for example, mm -hmm. that are paying artists um, for online residencies and that are mm -hmm. paying even more because they're realizing that 
there's a lot more work that's that's being involved in um, in all of these extras, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. or, yeah. Or where the, the, the like, for example, I just did a, a residency and an exhibition at Burrard Arts Foundation. And I think in all the folks that I've worked with over my, my career, they're the ones that put the most of these expanded content kind of things on. There was like a, you know, there was an art, there was an exhibition statement, there was an artist interview, there was a write up about the artist's uh, practice, there was a video walkthrough of the process, there was a video interview. There, I mean, it was really like kind of, you know, to the point where I thought, like, whoa, this is, um, this is really intense. But uh, they had paid uh, proper fees for everything that uh, that their artists were doing. They had paid above CARFAC rates. Uh, and all of this extra content, they were producing it themselves. They were hiring and paying writers to do it. They were hiring and paying videographers. And so in that sense, um, it, yeah, it, it made sense. It worked out. Hmm. What are some other good examples of? Um... Well, I was thinking really of, um, I, I'm seeing I'm seeing so many so we can talk about exhibitions for sure but I think that within exhibitions there are some uh, some fee structures that we can follow from Carfax the 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 problem I think that arises is that many of these online shows actually have the same requirements as brick and mortar uh, gallery shows typically do but even more so, right? Like it goes even beyond that mm -hmm. in the sense that, um, for example, what, what we were doing at the beginning of the pandemic and I think is still happening now is galleries would uh, have to do a show maybe exclusively online, but the show was basically like uh, a video walkthrough of the show. Well, then you still need a physical hanging of the show. So you still need your preparators. You still need to put bring the work in the space. You still need to put it up. But then on top of all that, you're having to set up, right, either hire people or do it yourself, of setting up all the lighting and the gear and doing the filming and doing the editing and then hosting it online and then uh, promoting that in a different way. So that just really becomes like you're doing two shows, right? Even a show that's exclusively online um, that doesn't have any physical space while you're still having to produce a new body of work potentially for that show right if it's if it's that kind of exhibition which oftentimes those are if it's for artist run centers or, or those kinds of more experimental spaces um, and then you're still needing uh, professional documentation for it so it's it's just it, it still has the same requirements and, and often a lot more so um, there are, are they usually examples. asking you to do that like, are, are they asking you to document it and videotape it and all of that? It really depends, right? If it's something that is, um, if it's a space that's at a distance and where the show is now exclusively happening online, then yes, a lot of artists are being asked to just do that in their studio somehow and figure that out and then and then put it all online. Um, mm -hmm. In the case of commercial galleries or, or nonprofit galleries, um, mostly the folks that I've worked with, they've been either doing it themselves or they've been offering some kind of a fee or support uh, to have to have uh, myself or, or another artist do it. I think um, there are some great folks that we can look to for uh, residencies and um, those would include like Saw Video uh, based in Toronto, for example, has a fantastic uh, sort of structure for that where they're offering, they're making sure that they're still offering those curatorial visits, those public engagement opportunities, they're paying for that, they're paying uh, artists for their time that they'll be doing that residency. There's a call that just came out very recently for uh, uh, Transmedial Gallery based in Berlin, where they're offering uh, basically like a a living kind of stipend for each of the months that the, the artist is uh, working on the residency because you know typically they would be including a studio they would be including some some tools some gear some supplies and now none of that is happening so if anything you need to say as an artist okay well then how how are you taking care of that probably you're having to go and do your own rentals maybe right and so you need to make sure that yeah you're getting paid for that as well.
I can see we have a, a question here from. Uh, Yeah, I was going <laughs> to um, just read a couple of questions. Um, one is if you've already um, done the online program, you know, you've signed the contract for that, but then later on, if they decide to keep that performance up for additional time that you didn't know. So how would an artist negotiate? Like, what are their rights? How would, would they just go back to the organizer and say they want a new contract? Or, you know, what would your recommendations be for something like that? Well, if there was a contract written in the first yeah. place, then it's not within their right to just say, okay, I'm, I'm just going to keep showing this work now, right? There would need to be, uh, yes, there would need to be a new contract or an addendum to that initial contract that both parties would need to be in agreement with and, and would need to sign on. Um, if there wasn't something so formal that was established in the first place, then still certainly there's the expectation that the artist would receive in writing uh, that request. And then it's up to the artist, right? I mean, some, like, a lot of folks are struggling right now, right? And artists are certainly struggling, uh, but so are uh, some of these venues and, and spaces, especially those that normally would be uh, relying on ticket prices, right, or, or ticket sales to be making some income. So I think there's a little bit of that as well of considering as an artist, like, um, again, I mean, I, I sound like a broken record, but like, what's the cost benefit to you as an artist to being able to leave that online? And if it's something where you think your audience is greatly going to expand uh, from that. The fee that you've been paid, you feel adequately covers that you're not incurring more costs, then maybe it's okay to, to go with it on that front, right? But if, if there's any feeling that, um, that that's maybe a little bit unfair or unjust, or you're not getting adequate benefit for that, for that longer run, then you need, to, you need to feel comfortable negotiating that. And one thing that I've, I've told, um, some of my students in the past when when contract negotiation comes up and folks are sort of maybe feeling really uncomfortable about that there are a number of different ways that you can go about it um right you can if you're represented by a gallery then that that person is supposed to be able to represent you and and speak for you um so you can easily uh that's something that they can that they can take on for you as you can say i need you you know this is not okay with me this is the outcome that I want. I need you to go negotiate this for me. And that's something that gallerists will do. But likewise, even if you're a student or, or an emerging artist or someone who's working just outside of those, those boundaries of, of that kind of relationship, um, you can easily have a friend pick up the phone and, and act as your representative for that particular negotiation. So I know this, this is kind of an aside, but I, I thought I'd just throw it out there. Yeah, copyright collectives do it too. Um, so. And it, and like I can't speak for all of them, but like copyright visual arts, it's free to join, um, and they do they they negotiate higher rates than ours, and they charge an an admin fee to the user. So it takes the like personal pressure off you from uh, the negotiation. Uh, one more question: um, Small galleries and online shows seem to be asking for fees from artists. Um, including pro photos and process videos. If you can just talk a little bit more about that and your thoughts. Um, I'm not sure if she's referring to mostly commercial galleries or not, but mm. I do know smaller galleries definitely struggled this past year, so they might not be able to have as big a fee, but asking fees for artists, I'm not really sure what kind of spaces would be doing that. I mean, there, there are what we call sort of pay to play galleries right mm -hmm. or vanity galleries um, and those are spaces who make their income exclusively off of charging an artist to show their work um, and so I think that that's a very different kind of structure than than maybe what we're focusing on today we're focusing more on the the professional um, kind of uh, I guess venues um, but those those are some for sure I mean there are many many galleries and, and venues that that operate in that way as well and then again it's I think for the artist to consider what what are the costs and, and benefits that you're getting from there and typically from that you're bringing your own audience you're bringing your own uh, legwork putting together you know the show the the documentation the promotion and all of that and so um, 
it, it becomes maybe more of a almost like a rental kind of situation so I think it's um, yeah we Carfax certainly doesn't have any kind of benchmarks around that 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 would be more up to the individual artist we just generally recommend people stay away from them um yeah like there are a lot of like pop-up festivals who even sometimes that like they ask artists to what was it well either pay to submit and then you have to like sell tickets and it's really really sketchy actually um and rarely like there's always a promise that there's going to be some great audience and people are going to buy your work but it doesn't really happen so I, I mean, we definitely don't recommend those kind of venues. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like, not just asking people, not asking artists to pay to be in these things. So I think you're talking about um, photos and like studio shots and stuff like that. Like, I know that um, like often, like if you're, if you're talking on something like this, somebody will ask you for a headshot. And um, I, I can't speak for, for a presenter, but like, if we ever do that, if we have a conference, like we don't require that it be a, like a professional photo, like it could literally be anything. And if they really want you to provide like a professionally shot image of yourself or your studio, then they should they should give you some compensation towards that. I mean, I think it wouldn't be the worst thing to just get one and always have one anyway, but um, uh, I, I wouldn't. I, I, I know very few places that actually have like requirements about what it has to look like and yeah. There's been, I've noticed a lot of talk lately about people who say like, why are they even asking for this? Like, what, why do they care what I look like? I, don't they want to look at my work? And it's like, well, in some ways it's nice to know who made it because um, unlike every other artistic discipline that that information isn't always obvious when you walk into a gallery, like you see an actor or a perform or a dancer or a musician, but there's, you know, we don't know as much about visual artists unless you read a wall text. And so I think it doesn't hurt to have um, yeah, studio shots or images of yourself. But um, yeah, I think if people are really picky about what, what you have to submit, you might want to think about whether you want to work with them or say okay cool have you got a budget for that yeah yeah and as artists like you know what's a portrait anything can anything can be a portrait right there are so many there are so many options there as well so sometimes uh pushing pushing back on that um i'm not a fan of all the personal information requirement like what year were you born in and like mm -hmm. who did you like you know, if it's part if it's part of your work or if it's part of what you want to present to the public, great. But otherwise, I think it's okay to um, to push back on that. And I think we're just in a time right now where a number of organizations are again we're we're still kind of flying blindly. Like it's been a year now, so there are there are more and more of these um, you know kind of uh, I guess not standards, but but at least uh, existing kind of experiences and benchmarks that we can use sort of as a, as a basis for how we do things. But I would say in my experience so far, artists are being asked for far more than what is even necessary just because an organization or an institution feels like um, it's almost like a worry of not not having enough to to kind of show within you know the the virtual world so we're being asked for much much more and, and um yeah in in a number of cases i think you have to just say no or say well sure but you've only paid to present my work and so if you want all of this extra stuff then it's you know it's going to be Three hundred and twenty-two dollars, I think, is the the speaker fee, right? Or plus, you know, what it's going to cost you to film uh, and all of that. Yeah, we're in an interesting situation where, like, usually we would mostly talk about exhibition fees, and now it's like, well, when everybody's shut and people want your time and your labor um, as much, if not more, so than your actual work, then um, you have to value it because if you don't, then no one will. So, yeah. So we don't really have any other questions. Um, so I think we can start to wrap up. I don't know if you had any um, final comments or 
Um, any other tips for artists? I know a lot of them are saying, agreeing with you on the being asked for a lot more, being asked, you know, even to pay more um, in terms of their own documentation and that sort of thing. Um, and just, yeah, if you have any tips for artists who are looking to, uh, you know, make this move online, but also work equitably with galleries. Um, I mean, the one, the, sorry, sorry, the one comment I'm getting is about, and I know this is common in a lot of smaller galleries where they ask you, uh, you have to have a membership and you have to pay for that membership before you can show in the gallery. Um, usually, hopefully the membership isn't too high, but <laughs> any sort of feedback for artists on that? Again, I, I think it kind of depends, right, on the, the, the type of, of gallery. Is it is it a commercial is it a commercial situation um, where the, the gallery is primarily making money off of the artists um, sort of participating? And, and in that case, if you know that you're a great salesperson and that you're going to make tons of sales anyway, then you know maybe it's worth it. Uh, but there are also some formats, especially within if we're looking at, um, I mean, with online, that really shouldn't be the case because we don't have the same costs as we have in a in a big city having to pay rent but there are those instances as well right where it's sort of it doesn't fall within necessarily the strictly for-profit world um, nor the the charitable uh, foundation or, or not-for-profit society and that would be a situation where maybe it's kind of like a collective sort of situation where a group of artists come together and say well we're all going to pay a certain amount of small fees per month to collectively pay for the rent and the administration and the promotion um, so that we can each sort of benefit in whichever way we want for our own careers. And so for some artists, it's the curatorial work involved. For some, it's being able to show um, in, a, in a professional space and get good documentation of your work. For others, it's being able to host maybe a I mean, now it's going to be more an online event, a vernissage or, or an opening, uh, but being able to grow your audience that way. So um, there are some of those instances, but, you know, um, in Canada, and again, this is really particular to Canada, we're very, very lucky that we have the kinds of funding that we have here. Uh, whereas in the States, right, for example, a number of not-for-profit galleries, I mean, they have to charge. Uh, submission fees and they have to there there are a number of things there that happen just because there's not the same I'm gonna backtrack for a sec they do not have to there are plenty of millionaires living in the United States billionaires living there that should be funding the arts and that should be doing these things and so those venues can be fundraising in, in alternate ways um, but all I mean is that it it, it does become um, perhaps their there aren't quite as many systems maybe in place um, to to be able to to pay artists in the same ways that that we do. So there would just be that that side as well that it can still be a reputable venue that's a not for profit space, but that maybe is also charging a little bit. Um, in in we were talking about sort of submission fees or or call fees. Um, so that's something that might happen as well. Great. Well, again, I don't see any further questions, so I think we can just wrap it up, um, unless you had anything else to add. Um, I will just say thank you so much, both Annie and April, for joining us today. Um, I see in the chat April has included her email, so if you did have any specific questions or examples um, that you wanted to ask her about, there's her email uh, at, at the CARFAC office. Um, so I wanted to thank both of you again, and thank you everybody out there for watching. Um, I also do recommend um, checking out Carfax website. They have a ton of resources for artists and a lot of links, um, as well as you can also contact, contact them as well if you did have very specific questions. Um, I wanted to um, thank you for sharing your afternoon with me, everybody. Um, we have recorded this, so it will be available on the Richmond Art Gallery's website and YouTube channel soon. Um, and then we will include the edited uh, English transcription as well. Um, so Art at Work is actually going to be taking a bit of a break. Uh, we'll be back in September. So stay tuned for that and we'll have another session um, on something related to professional development for visual artists. 
Uh, so till then, stay safe, everybody. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again. Bye. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Thanks for joining. Thanks.